I didn't invent the word uh, consilience. It's, uh, I took it from the literature of the history and philosophy of science, where it has been rarely used since it was first used in 1840, uh, uh, by, uh, and has uh, afterward by uh, a few scholars. No one knew really what it is. It's in the Oxford unabridged, and that's about it. And I introduced it to the mainstream. And it means uh, the uh, putting together of very different bodies of information, usually covered by distinct disciplines, uh, into a, a cause and effect connection to show that they are connected in some manner by cause and effect. And that's what I thought knowledge generally was ready for uh, at the end of this uh, last century because particularly of the exponential growth of scientific knowledge and capability in fields like neuroscience and uh, human genetics and uh, evolutionary biology, including sociobiology. It was promising. So. Uh, I went and I, I wrote the book on this and uh, showed what the connections might be and what the evidence was and what we needed to know. And after that I said, well, I've had a stab at synthesizing all of knowledge. Now what else is there to synthesize? Well, I'm, that's it. I'm done. I can't go on. Uh, and it remains to be seen how successful that notion is. But to the extent it's successful, and, and accepted, I do believe that it could transform uh, education, particularly the liberal arts. It also, I believe, points to whole new areas of research and scholarship for not just the natural sciences, but also for scholars in the social sciences and humanities to explore. It's an open field, set of frontiers, and I hope they won't look on it as impassable barriers, or that it's somehow uh, impious to uh, try to uh, go from one to the other by cause and effect relation. How would your family, friends, and even yourself have thought about a young butterfly collector in Mobile, Alabama, mm -hmm. metamorphosing into an Enlightenment scholar? <laughs> Uh, well, some rather strange people, you know, have uh, worked out of butterflies. Uh, there's, uh, there's Vladimir Nabokov, for example, in literature. Uh, I think it's a, a logical progression, actually. Uh, it's not the most usual, but uh, we all tend to uh, start with some kind of narrow focus upon which we uh, uh, con uh, converge a great deal of, of youthful passion and heat, and then broaden our horizons to encompass other interests or shift to them and the like, and never, never forget what gave us those feelings at the beginning. So basically, I'm always just a boy with a butterfly net. And if I were told I could do nothing else uh, the rest of my life except uh, study and collect butterflies, I might do it. If I, if he's up there uh, in um, uh, wherever we might go after we pass on, I, I think I'd enjoy doing it in the in, in the heavenly Alps with Nabokov. I remember, uh, in with respect to. Uh, how you never lose the initial passions, something that Camus once said. Uh, he said that all of art consists of the tortuous routes we take of discovery uh, to uh, recapture those images in the presence of which our soul first opened. And I think that that formula does explain a lot of creativity and a lot of the particularity and I suppose in my case eccentricity 
of a scholarly career. Thank you very much for a wonderful interview. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're attached.